your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if you're disappointed this morning, I'm sorry. Uh, but you just get what you get and you don't throw a fit. So take your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. We're going to study verses 1 through 10 together this morning. And if you're using one of the Pew Bibles, that's on page 1323. 1323. 1,323. Um, a few years back, I went to one of the many Thanksgiving gatherings that you end up going to. You know, you have your dad's side of the family, and then you have your mom's side of the family, and then you have your own kind of family, then you have your spouse's family, and you end up having five or six different Thanksgiving gatherings. Oh, and don't forget the church one, right? So uh, you, you put on a lot of weight during Thanksgiving time. And uh, I don't know about you, but what I look forward to the most Every year at Thanksgiving time, it's not the Dallas Cowboys, okay? Pumpkin pie, right? Anyone else feel that this morning? Love to have some pumpkin pie. And so a few years ago, uh, I was at one of those Thanksgiving gatherings. I won't say which one, but some of my family will know. And uh, I, I saw that pumpkin pie there. I got up, I finished my plate, my main meal, and I went over there and I cut myself a big old slice of pumpkin pie, right? And I'm so excited. And then a few of us sit down and just got that pie around the same time. We sit down and, and we start taking some bites of that pie. And we all began to kind of look up at each other. Just look around the room at each other, everybody that was eating that pie. You know, we didn't have to say anything, but just the look kind of told you something was not right about this pumpkin pie, right? And so we all kind of figured out that this pie did not have any sugar or any sweetener whatsoever, right? Whoever made it just forgot one ingredient and it ruined the whole thing. It ruined the whole thing. I mean, it ruined my year. It was Thanksgiving and I couldn't even be thankful anymore because my pie was just, it was just pumpkin mush with crust and it was disgusting, okay? Absolutely terrible. But all it took was missing one ingredient. That was it, and the whole thing was ruined. This morning, we're going to go back to the basics. If you know 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you know it's often referred to as the resurrection chapter, and that's really what it is. So we're going to go back this morning and look at the basics, remind ourselves of the foundation of our faith, and that is the gospel message. And we're going to seek to understand the essential elements, the essential ingredients if you will, of the gospel pie. We want to understand what all are the essential ingredients of this thing we call the gospel. Now, you may be thinking, the gospel message is very basic, right? It, it should be the first thing we understand. It should be the thing we understand the greatest. So why bother going back to the gospel? We already know that. That's elementary, right? That's what we may be tempted to think. Well, for one, it is the most important doctrine of the church, it's the most important message that we have is the gospel message. There are other important things, things that we must talk about. Anything that the Bible speaks of, we're going to preach about it. Whether the world has tried to make it into a political issue or not, if it's something that the Bible speaks on, we're going to say, thus saith the Lord on this issue. We're going to preach through every word of God. We're going to cover everything. It may take a long time to get there, but we're going to cover everything. It may take us 10 weeks to get through three verses of 1 John, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to get there eventually, right? It's going to take us a while. So, so we're going to talk about baptism. You're going to hear us talk about uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, the Lord's Supper, uh, finances, church discipline, church leadership, evangelism, discipleship, the sanctity of life, sanctification, uh, the things of the future. These are all important things that we've got to talk about. We don't ignore these things. And we must know what we believe about these things, but the gospel is superior to all of these things. There's nothing that is more important to the gospel. It, it, it is the foundation of everything. We cannot afford to get the gospel wrong. Amen. Listen, you can be wrong on a few things, and I can still be your friend. We can still fellowship together. We can still work together, but you cannot be wrong on the gospel. If you are wrong on the gospel, you are not my brother or sister in Christ. I'm sorry to tell you that, but that's what the Bible teaches us. We don't ever graduate from the gospel message. Right. We, have, we think this is just the message for when you get saved, and then you move on from it, and you do other things, right? We don't graduate from the gospel message. Amen. 
It's the most important doctrine that there is. Secondly, the gospel affects everything else in our lives. It affects everything. When Paul wrote this book of 1 Corinthians, it was a letter to the church in Corinth. And if you know a little bit about that letter, man, this is a church that was messed up. This was a church that had some issues. He said, y'all got some issues that isn't even named among the Gentiles. I mean, they were doing stuff that the world was like, that's messed up, bro. That's messed up. We don't want anything to do with that. You guys are weird. Y'all can have your church service. We're not interested. This was a church that, let's be honest, we would not want to be a member of. You'd probably drive to another town to go to a different church and avoid this place. And so if you look through the book of 1 Corinthians, you're going to continually see with each problem, Paul points it back to Christ. He points it back to the gospel. He points, uh, talks about they, they, they were dealing with pride. They were dealing with uh, some division in their church. And he points them to Christ. He says, you're saved because of Christ. The Spirit has enabled you. The, the gospel message has been given through foolish people because it, it's the power of God. And so we continually, every problem points them back to the gospel because the gospel affects everything else in our lives as Christians. Everything else. And so when you fix your eyes back on the gospel and return to the basics, it changes the way you live. That's how you heal a broken church is by dwelling on the gospel message. So we don't move on from it. And the third reason that we need to go back to the basics is even though the gospel is the most basic doctrine of the church and the most important doctrine, there's nothing that is more, uh, that is more misunderstood and incorrectly taught than the gospel message. Sadly, that's the way it is. People misunderstand it. People mi teach it incorrectly. Some people purposely understand if you're even missing one ingredient from it, you've ruined the whole thing. You were probably wondering how the story tied in, but there you go. So we're going to return to that grand old message this morning, the foundation of our faith. And some today who are listening, you might, you might find out that the gospel isn't what you thought it was. Uh, you, some of us uh, may just understand it more clearly, and praise be to God for that. Some of us maybe have neglected the gospel message, and we've treated it like it's a basic elementary principle that we've moved on from, and may you return your focus to the gospel this morning. And so that's our desire as we dig into this. So our first point in this message is the content of the gospel. The content of the gospel. Uh, these are the essential ingredients, the essential elements of the gospel message. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you were saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So Paul is giving a very simple and straightforward explanation of the gospel message. And notice the gospel message has not changed. It doesn't change along with culture. It doesn't change along with the church. The gospel remains the same. It's the same as it was the first time he declared it to him. It's the same message that he received. And he's sharing it with them. Verse 3, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So the first sub-point, sub-point A to our first point, the content of the gospel, is Christ died for our sins. So we have to pay attention to every single detail in these words or we're going we're gonna to miss something. Okay, so first, who died for our sins? Christ. Christ did. And that word Christ means Messiah. It means the anointed one. It is Jesus of Nazareth, born of a virgin, the Son of God, God the Son, the Son of Man, as he often called himself. He is God in the flesh. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. The one that the Father promised he would send into the world through the lineage of Abraham, through the lineage of David, one who would be a king that would rule forever. The one who would crush the head of the serpent, that devil. So Jesus is at the very center of this gospel message. If you miss Jesus, you've missed the gospel. In fact, if, you, if, if it was possible to explain the gospel in just one word, I think that's the best way, Jesus. Amen. Jesus. That's the best way to explain it. Of course, you have to know some other stuff, but if you ain't got, if you ain't got Jesus, you ain't got the gospel. That's not good English, but that's good theology. And so we read that Christ died, right? And he didn't just die, though. If you know the story, he was brutally 
executed by Roman crucifixion on a cross. And Jesus on that cross breathed his final breath and died. He literally, physically died a human death. God in the flesh died. Think about that. He didn't just pass out, as some people might say. He was as dead as dead can get. He was dead. And what was the purpose of his death? Paul says that Christ died for what? Our sins. He did not die because he got old and died of natural causes. He did not die because he got too involved in an attempt to overthrow the government and then got in trouble with the Romans and they put him to death. That's not what he got caught. That's not what happened. That's not why he died. He didn't try to start a political revolution. He didn't, and he wasn't trying to just overthrow the Romans and crown himself king. In fact, he told his disciples, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. He did not die for his own sins because he did not have any. He died as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. Christ's death on the cross satisfies God's holy wrath against us in our sin. If you are in your sin today, if you've never been redeemed, God's holy wrath is against you. And I've got to warn you, if I love you, I will warn you. And through the cross, he made peace for us. He made peace for us, washed our sins away. And it's explained for us throughout the scriptures. Let me point you to a few that you might write down. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Mark chapter 10, verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. His death is our ransom. It paid the way so that we can go free. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. It's been described very, very simply. We broke the law and Jesus paid the fine. So in order to truly understand the gospel, you do have to be confronted with your sin. You must be brought to a repentant place realizing that your sin will cost you an eternity in hell unless you turn to Christ for salvation. Turn to Him for rescue. But you also must understand what Christ did about it. Christ died for your sins so that you won't face the penalty for your sins. I love the way Romans chapter 3 describes it for us. Uh, the book of Romans, if you look at the first few chapters, it just lays out there at the very beginning that we are all guilty before God, that we have all broken God's law. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you're guilty. Whether you had the law or not, you even have the law in your conscience, and you've broken that too. We're all guilty before God, but then it explains how we can be forgiven. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26 says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness. Because in His forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Amen. Do you know what propitiation is? It's a big word. It's a sacrifice that turns away wrath. Jesus was that sacrifice. Through his blood, which was shed for us on the cross, God's wrath was turned away from us. And through the cross, Jesus is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith. He justifies the guilty. 
He justifies those who have faith in Christ. Even though we're guilty, he makes us just in his sight. How can he be just if he does that? Because he did pay for sins himself. He took it upon himself. And so he remains just because he poured out his wrath upon his son. Uh, Pastor Erwin Lutzer, uh, I've heard a story that he used to talk about how when he would teach at a Bible college, that uh, sometimes he would ask his students, well, every year at the beginning of the year, he would ask his students, he would say, raise your hand if you think the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus was bad. And so you'd have, they'd kind of look, kind of, you're looking at me like right now, they would, they would kind of just kind of nervously raise their hands, a few of them, and just kind of look around the room to see if anyone else agreed with them. And then they'd put their hand down really quickly. And then he would ask, okay, how many of you, Raise your hand if you think that the cross was good. And pretty much the same response. If you would kind of raise their hand a little bit unsure and look around the room, does anyone agree with me? And then he would say, you should have confidently raised your hand for both. Yes, the cross was bad. It was brutal. Jesus was unjustly executed for crimes he did not commit. It was a brutal death. Even still, the cross was good because Jesus willingly gave himself as a ransom for us. And it is through the cross that our sins can be washed away. Are you thankful for what God has done on the cross? I'm so thankful. Our second subpoint, subpoint B, is that Christ rose from the dead. A literal physical resurrection. Verse 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Sadly, this is a part of the gospel that sometimes gets forgotten. I've been guilty of it. We love to talk about the cross, and yes, we should talk about the cross, and yes, it's appropriate to specifically preach and focus on the cross. If you don't think so, just read through your Bible. You're going to find it all over the place. But we have not given a gospel presentation until we've talked about the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. So in the same way that the gospel without Christ's death on the cross is not the gospel, the gospel without Christ risen from the dead is also not the gospel. It is essential. Both are essential elements to the message. These are the two pillars that the gospel is built upon. And without, with one missing, the whole thing crumbles down. They are both necessary. If we have a Christ who died and did not rise, then why should we trust in him? How can we know that his death mattered? We know it mattered because he arose. And if you don't think that it's essential, you think, you know, maybe, maybe this is just some story. Maybe it's just some allegory. Maybe Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. Or maybe he died later on. If you don't think the resurrection is absolutely necessary, just read the rest of this chapter. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says that if Christ is not risen, our faith is empty. You know what that means? We ought to shut the doors. We ought to sell it to someone else. We ought to, ought to go home. And we ought to just watch football and play golf on Sundays. There's no reason for us to do this if Christ is not risen. He says that our faith is empty. It's meaningless. So both of these elements are essential. His death pays for our sins, but his victory over death guarantees us a new eternal life. Once again, we can read many passages that explain this to us. John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. John chapter 6, verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone, who, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. You understand that? Your loved ones who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who are gone from you, their spirits are with the Lord right now, but Christ is the first fruits. They're going to follow in his example, and those bodies are going to rise from the dead one day. 
He has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, that is by Adam, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who were Christ's at his coming. And lastly, 1 Corinthians chapter 50, 15, verses 50 through 57. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible has, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his resurrection that we have eternal life. And that we have a promise that we too will rise one day. So are you thankful that we don't have a dead Savior? We have a Savior who is risen, a Savior who is Lord. The third sub-point, uh, letter C, hold fast in faith. This is the required response to these truths that Christ died for our sins and rose again from the dead. Once again, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. It is through what Christ has done, having died and rose, that we are able to stand. That is, that we have right standing with God. And through this message, we can be saved. That is, we are forgiven of our sins. We're given eternal life. We're rescued from our bondage to sin, rescued from hell, guaranteed that we too will be raised to life. That is what it is to be saved. But it is not universally applied to all. It is not. This gift is only applied to those who hold fast to Christ in faith. To hold fast is to take hold of it and not let go. It is to receive His grace by faith, and guess what? He holds on to you. He is holding on to you. Romans chapter 4, verse 16 says, Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham. The only way that salvation can be by grace is if it is received through faith. He says it is, it is of faith that, that, that it might be of grace. In other words, if you receive salvation by any work, by anything other than by simple faith in Him, it's not of grace. That is not salvation by grace. Now, don't misunderstand faith. Faith is not simply to know a fact and just believe that that fact is true. That's to believe in vain. That is how the demons believe. James chapter 2, verse 19. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So faith is not simply to agree that something is true. That's knowledge. And faith includes that. It must have knowledge, but that is not all it is. Not all it is. Faith is to believe on something. It is to trust in something. To trust in God for this salvation, for this forgiveness of sins, for this everlasting life. To trust God for it by Christ's death and resurrection. To believe on Him for it. To rely on Him for it. As Jesus often said, repent and believe the gospel. You recognize that you were lost and headed for hell, hopeless without Him because of your sin, and you turn to fully rely on Him. And He saves you by what He has done, by dying for our sins and rising again. That is the gospel. The gospel is not only that Christ died for your sins. The gospel is not only that Christ rose from the dead. These two things must go hand in hand. They must go hand in hand. It is not that Christ did these things so that you can have a good and happy life. 
It is not that Christ did these things, so if you'll be a better person, he'll save you. That's not the gospel. It's not that if you'll join a church, he'll save you. The gospel is not God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. But sadly, that's what many men are saying in the pulpits of our country. They've watered down the gospel. And there's no mention of Christ's death for our sins, of his resurrection from the grave. The gospel is not even that you can have your sickness healed, and I believe God does heal. But it is not that you can have your sickness healed. There are many godly people who have eternal life that will die with a sickness. The gospel is that message by which we are saved if we will turn to believe on Christ because he died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, and rose again according to the scriptures. Our second point in this passage is the confirmation of the gospel. So I want you to understand as we look at these next few verses that this death and resurrection of Jesus, it's not just some story. It's not Greek mythology. Not Jewish mythology. It's not just an allegory. It's not just some story about how you can overcome your trials like Jesus did. That's not what it is. Have fun with that all the way to hell. What what good is that? This is true history. It's stuff that really happened. They are literal historical events that are confirmed to us. We have evidence for this truth that Christ died and rose Again, and the first evidence we see for the death and resurrection of Christ in the, is the scriptures themselves. Paul says that Christ died according to the what? And that he was buried and that he rose again according to the, the scriptures. So what is our evidence for this? It is the scriptures. We look to what the word of God says and this tells us what happened. But what is... Paul referring to as he writes these things. Consider, Paul might not even be talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're talking early on in church history when these books were not widespread. So when Paul refers to the scriptures, and as you see where he often quotes, now, these people were often familiar with each other's writings. Peter refers to Paul's writings in one of his letters. But we have no assurance that Paul is talking about the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It seems that Paul is referring to the Old Testament as an evidence that Christ died and rose again. He's referring to the scriptures that they were all very familiar with. Now, there is a sense in which Paul, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit as he writes these words. So he's probably referencing Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in a future sense as well. And so we have the New Testament scriptures as evidence for the gospel today. We have it as our written historical record that Jesus really did die and Jesus really did rise again. Understand, all history is handed down by word of mouth or by being written down. So based on the New Testament alone, we have more evidence for Jesus and what he did than just about anything else in history at that time. Yet as I said, Paul's referring to Old Testament passages. And some of us go, really? Is Paul really going to talk about the death and resurrection of Jesus from the Old Testament? You bet. You bet he was. There's enough evidence alone in the Old Testament to tell us about Christ's death and resurrection. Here's Christ's death in the Old Testament. Psalm 22, verse 1. The psalmist speaking prophetically says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you're familiar with the story of the cross, you know those words that Jesus cried out on the cross. Isaiah chapter 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And we also have the entire Old Testament sacrificial system, which pointed to the cross. It was teaching us about sacrifice and about substitution. The Passover, guess what it pointed to? The cross. The story of the serpent on the pole in the wilderness that was lifted up in the book of Numbers. Guess who that pointed to? Christ on the cross. We have prophecies throughout the Old Testament about how Christ's Clothes would be taken. We have prophecies about how none of his bones would be broken. The Old Testament predicted 
the death of Christ. And the New Testament records it for us. But the Old Testament also tells us about the resurrection of our Savior. Psalm 16, verse 10, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, now, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Jesus also explained that the entire story of Jonah, it pointed forward to the resurrection of Jesus. Now that was a real story, real historical stuff that happened, but it also pointed toward Christ. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Just three days, because he was coming out. Job chapter 19, verse 25 and 26, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Those words were probably written before many of the other words in Scripture, one of the oldest books. And yet Job knew that he one day would rise and that he would see his Redeemer. So the gospel, the, both the death and resurrection of Jesus, it is found throughout the Old Testament. Now, it wasn't always clear, but when Jesus came on the scene, it became clear. And we now, we see without a veil, and we can see Christ clearly. So the first evidence that we have for the gospel is the scriptures themselves. But Paul continues on to share more. Verse 5. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. So Jesus was seen by Cephas, that's the apostle Peter. And we have Peter's written testimony in his writings and in his messages there in the book of Acts. Jesus was also seen by the twelve. John chapter 20, verses 19 and 20 says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Now, when we consider that Jesus was seen by the twelve, by these disciples, guess what? Their names are written for us. People knew these people. So if anyone had a doubt about this, you could easily go and ask someone. You know how the media lies? They say, uh, uh, we have this from an undisclosed source, an unnamed source, you know, and they often do that. My thing is, if you're telling the truth, just tell it. Why does it always got to be hidden? They didn't hide who they were. These people believed that they had seen the risen Lord, and anyone could have come up to them and asked them, is it true? Is he really alive? And then at some point, Jesus was seen by over 500 people at the same time. Now, you all know it's really hard to get even two people to agree on a lie, isn't it? But to get 500 of them to agree? Or maybe you want to claim that 500 people, just they all saw a vision. It was just all uh, the same dream. But they were all convinced it was real. He was also seen by James and all the rest of the apostles. James is a very important one. Because you know what? You can read about earlier in Jesus' ministry, this is the half-brother of Jesus. Earlier in his ministry, he did not believe. He did not believe his brother. In fact, they thought Jesus was crazy. They thought he was a lunatic. They thought, Jesus, you're going to get yourself into some trouble here. By these things you're saying to the Pharisees, you're calling them serpents. You better slow down, Jesus. Why don't you come home and have a bite to eat? Why don't you come home and take a little nap? They thought he was crazy. But guess what? James saw the risen Lord. He saw him. After all the people knew, he was dead and he was buried. He saw him and that transformed his life. And that's one of the greatest testimonies of the resurrection of Jesus. And did you know that just about every scholar agrees that these people are real historical people that at least believed that they saw the risen Lord and they were willing to die for that belief. I don't know about you, but I would not be willing to die for something if I knew it was not true, if I knew it was a lie. 
I wouldn't be willing to die for it. So I don't know about you, but I don't believe these men were lying. They knew they really saw the risen Lord. And now Paul points out one final witness to the resurrected Lord. Verse 8. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Paul says that he also saw the risen Lord. But it was a little bit later than the rest. And once again, just like James, Paul's testimony is one of our greatest pieces of evidence that Jesus really did rise from the dead. He was a persecutor of the saints, of anyone who proclaimed that Jesus had risen. He was breathing out murderous threats against these, against these people. It takes a miracle to change someone like that. You know what it took? Seeing the risen Lord. And he saw him. And after that, Paul was transformed. That brings us to our last point, the consequences of the gospel. What does this message result in? Paul describes himself as the least of the apostles. He was saying, I don't deserve to be used by this man in this way because of my past. Yet God's grace transformed his life. This was a man who once thought he had it all. He thought, you know what? I am the most Jewish Jew there is. <laughs> I am the most righteous Jew there is. I, 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 he was like that, that, that Pharisee praying there in that story that Jesus talked about where there was the religious man and the tax collector. He thought he had it all. But now we read his words and it says, I am the least of the apostles. I don't deserve to be used this way. I once hated Christians. I once hated these people that said that Christ had rose. I, I put them to death. And yet here he is, a humble man who has devoted his life to making sure others can come to know that Savior. That takes a miracle. It takes the gospel. It's not just some story. It's all true. Christ's death pays for our sins. His victory over death guarantees us eternal life. And all who trust in Him are saved. And when He saves you, He will transform you. And that is the gospel.